So let me let me just give you my personal opinion here on this thing. It's it's not sort of Y2K version two, and those of us who are old enough to remember Y2K, myself included, um, you know, it, it, it's a situation where I think you know if you have one subject or one email address, you know, you know, you're going to, in terms of being on the on the radar for any sort of regulatory or data protection authority activity is going to be exceedingly low. Right, um, but what the GDPR does, it forces down the consent landscape to the you know all all the people and organizations that touch that particular individual. So really, you know, we operate in an opt-out world here in the U.S. and obviously in most parts of the other parts of the world, it's more of an opt-in association, right? You can't can, you can't market to someone until you get their permission and consent. And so really, I think from a common sense perspective, some of the tenants of GDPR are things that we as digital organizations should be thinking about anyway, right? So, um, yeah, so, you know, the same thing is uh, is in play with Castle, you know, Canadian anti-spam legislation. You know, if you have one email, one Canadian email address on your list in Canada, then you're still, you know, theoretically supposed to comply to Castle as well. So, you know, the, the, there is a fundamental shift in terms of being able to be compliant or demonstrate compliance. And one of the things with GDPR is, is if you can demonstrate that you're trying to comply, then essentially, you know, you're complying. So uh, we can get into that a little bit later, but things like sign-up processes, you know, asking customers where they're coming from, you know, making sure that if someone's logging in or visiting your website from, you know, from a European country, you know about that and put the necessary mechanisms in place to um, to be compliant around that. But that's a great question because it does, it does, um, you know, it does create some level of you know, concern initially, but the reality is is that, you know, it, it, this whole thing is going to take a long time to play out from a compliance and regulatory perspective, meaning um, just as we saw here in the U.S. with CAN spam, when CAN spam went into effect in 2004, it took several years before you started to see any kind of like, you know, legal activity or any kind of lawsuits that were brought against marketers and the like uh, based on the interpretation of, of that particular regulation. So um, good news is this thing is coming. Bad news, it's, it's, a, it's a burden for us all. But the reality is at the end of the day, you know, some of the things that are in that bill, are in the bill, are just really common sense approach for managing your digital sort of footprint anyway. But keep those questions coming and we'll be more than happy to uh, give you some insights on that as we get into the presentation. So. Um, one of the things, the biggest things in, in terms of the GDPR is sort of which side of the data fence you sit on or you reside on, right? Um, you know, whether you are a data controller or whether you're a data processor. And under the GDPR, a data controller is, is essentially a person, in, you, you know, who determines the purposes of which and the manner of any personal data are to be possessed. So in the case of Act On, if you were an act-on client, you would be the controller and we would be the processor because essentially you would be uploading into our platform your data and you would make the determination of how that data is used. And so um, it's important to understand which side of that fence you're on because your obligations could be a bit different depending on if you're a controller or a processor. If you're a controller, you're more on the hook for the management of GDPR. If you're the processor, then you are on the hook, but not as deep as you would be if you actually own the relationship. So companies like us who have a marketing automation platform, uh, which use our marketing automation platform to market, we are both. In some instances, we are a processor, and in some instances, we are a controller. So our marketing department would be the controller, and the rest of the organization would be the processor. So it's important to understand where you sit on that fence, because as I said earlier, you do have some... Uh, some issues, uh, some some issues that you have to understand and, and adopt as you move forward. David, so another we're going to go down. To come in. Yeah. Sure. Oh, um, so you mentioned that um, Canada is adopting rules similar to this, and that um, obviously the EU is is adopting this. Is this based on your expertise? Anything that you foresee might be coming to the U.S. at some time that we might adopt? something similar to this? That's a, another great question. Um, so the, the, can, the Canada was the last sort of G8 country that introduced email legislation, which essentially went into effect two years ago. But it had been on the books for a number of years prior to that. And some would say it's probably one of the most restrictive uh, 
um, you know, pieces of email legislation that has been introduced on a global scale. Um, in the U.S., we're a, we are a secular, you know, sort of. A, uh, in terms of our privacy laws, they're more focused on a business model as opposed to blanket coverage. So think about things like HIPAA if you're on the if you're on the medical um, space. Think about COPA if you deal with kids. Think about Graham Leach Blaley if you're dealing with financial services, etc. So I don't I don't my, my personal feeling is I don't foresee a universal privacy um, you know privacy blanket that gets introduced into the U.S. anytime soon. What you may see are things like the tenants of permission, meaning more opt-in type um, activities around marketing efforts, um, but we don't have them yet, right? So, um, you know, consent is the, you know, is the essence of the digital relationship. Um, you know, if you don't have consent, then theoretically, you, you know, you, you can't start to forge that that you know that that relationship moving forward. So um, the appetite, I think, for universal privacy legislation in America is pretty low at this point in time. However, you may see um, because of some of the tenets of GDPR, meaning things like cross-border data transfer, that has to be in play. So if you're a company in the U.S., one of one of your obligations is to have a secure methodology for transferring data from European Union to the U.S. And that program um, is now called what's called the Privacy Shield. There are a couple of other mechanisms too, but um, you know the most common methodology is, is to is to self-certify with the with the government in a program called the Privacy Shield, uh, and that is an accepted methodology of transferring data from Europe back to the U.S. Now, if that if that um, if that transfer mechanism should uh, disappear for some reason, whatever whatever reason that might be. Then we, as data managers, um, could find ourselves in a situation where, um, you know, we we may have to be struggling to find a more adaptive way. So, to put that into context, if you have European customers, um, you know, European clients are very concerned about their data leaving the EU for very specific reasons. And if you cast your mind back two or three years ago for the shenanigans of Edward Snowden and the NSA, etc., there is a historical appetite to keep your data in Europe. So act on, um, you know, we have co-locations in Frankfurt and, and, and uh, Ireland uh, if we have clients who want to stay over there. If we don't and we, you know, we operate our business over here, you know, our privacy shield certification is an adequate data transfer mechanism. So it, it really depends at the end of the day on, on how sort of, you know, restrictive or how conservative your customer is in terms of their understanding of where their data should be. So, you know, universal privacy legislation in the U.S., probably not anytime soon. Would you see a fine-tuning of business practices in terms of more consent-based mechanisms? You know, I, it wouldn't probably be, it wouldn't surprise me if that was the case. And the reality is now anyway, is that if you're an email marketer and you are, you know, in that, in that channel, um, you know, you are sending, you know, you're being held accountable for information, you know, regardless if you're a lead acquisition or, you know, a mailer versus a retention-based mailer, you're still held accountable for retention-based practices anyway. So it's almost happening by default, um, and it's forcing companies to understand, you know, where they acquire their data, what, you know, how old that data is, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, sorry, long-winded answer to the question, but I think um, ultimately, you know, best practices will suffice, and, and that's kind of how we operate over here.